bits for a website, and then we go and actually see if those are deployed or not. And then we still have a DC, a DHCP, DNS server, and 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 web servers. Web servers. And, web servers. Just, and the idea is just to show you how to talk the hard stuff. And anybody has less than eight gigabytes of memory on their laptop. Okay. So things might be very slow for you because OS is <laughs> So are you deploying server cores or uh, doesn't matter because in the VMs we are saying use one gigabyte or five for them. It's the code itself, it's how many VMs it can support. That's the that's it. Okay. So we already set up the Yes, you already got this. You already got this in their papers. Oh, we should go through this a little bit. When you're done, you should have a set of directories on the box. So on the box, you'll have a PowerShell Summit directory. Inside there is actually four, uh, five folders which have the scripts. The first one is the working directory. That's the one you guys will play with. So it has template, and you are supposed to fill in the details once we finish the slides. The number one, which says build workshop, that's the scripts we used during TechEd and in build 2012 to set up this entire environment. So those are the old ways how things used to be done. That's Just for reference. There's a small improvement on what we did with TechEd shop. Then we actually ran it again, build 2012, just to show it. So we improved the scripts a bit there. Those are the usual way of doing it. And then, and the uh, directly said uh, two dash install setup slide says go to this folder and a subfolder and run something to make sure the environment is working. So that's a cheat sheet for you guys if you don't follow what in the code in the slide or you are right of it, then you can look at it. And three dash today is the answers for your working directory. So zero working directory where you work. Here's the pie, less screws, sort of way to go. The other thing I say, I say automation, what I really mean is good automation, right? Automation helps, better automation helps more, right? So it does kind of matter how you do it. All righty, and I've got a, what is the clicker word? Oh no, this is the pointer. All right, on pointer. No, it's all right. Um, so, Here's how we split it up. What we had before was essentially a, a pretty good, reasonably written script to take a look at the build directory with workflow, and you can follow it. We said is we need to split, separate intent from the stuff that makes it so. And intent can be expressed pretty simply. I should be able to say, hey, I want a Windows feature named Web Server. I, mean, I want all, all the Windows features that are available on the box. You're familiar with the Windows feature command lines. Most of the people are sort of nod, right? I want the web server, and I want the web ASP.NET uh, 4.5, and they should be present. And if I say absent, they should be removed. And if it's present, they should be there. And that's the only thing I got to worry about. That's a much nicer world than having to come down here into the code and actually do the work. So we want to separate the intent, what we think the thing ought to be, from what, how the way to make it so. This is just called, this is the declarative side, right? And this is a very standard approach to, towards heading towards some of the DevOps stuff. And Bruce talked about it a little bit, I think, already as we got public. This is just how you actually do this in PowerShell V3. Um, and once you get there, the second thing you notice is that um, there's actually two elements of the configuration. And this isn't quite as obvious until you start playing with it a bit. So we'll spend a little time. And one is what I call structural which means it doesn't change as you go from dev through test to pre-production. It's the same. I still want IIS on the stupid box or on the VM. I don't care, right? I still need the website there. I still need the structure of the stuff there. But then there's environmental stuff. All right, where are the VHDs copied from? That changes. If you guys went in, you went and changed your config environment, right? We just wanted to be able to change that one file, except in the setup, because that wasn't done this way. So we should still tell me. The clear demo, right? Um, but everything else, you just go to config environment, file. That's all you should have to change that one line. That should control your environment as you flow from development through test into production, everything else. That and that's how you know the difference between them. Because it, it's not an obvious line and it changes the within on your environment. You guys with me? So here's what I mean. Uh see that oh, and then one more thing, which is talking about good and bad automation. Um, the best automation is almost always item potent. 
which means you can run it again and again and again and get the same result. So it doesn't have the side effects. Right? And that turns out to be important. So if it runs and it fails, you'll just run it again and get a better answer. And then just run it again. And I'm going to like it, I should run it again. And that's how you actually prevent what I don't have. There's a slide that tells you why the hell you care. Um, you end up with two, or you end up with three attributes, well, two attributes, really, out of doing things this way. The first one is what I would call continuous deployment, which is you're always able to move stuff out very quickly, and you're able to flow it between the different organizations. There's no, hey, take this piece of code from developers, throw it over the wall to operations, and now they have to figure out how to deploy it. That's already done once, and you continue to flow through. So that's continuous deployment. The second thing you can begin to get is preventing configuration drift. Anybody ever experienced configuration drift on their systems? Right, somebody goes in and whacks stuff by accident. Doing things this way has a tendency to let you to help you prevent configuration drift because you just rerun it. And you just rerun it on a constant schedule. So long as you've got everything configured right, and so long as your automation is item perfect, and you've tested that, you're in good shape and just do it again and again and again. So that's actually, and the mindset shifts a little bit, just to be, I'll spend a few more seconds on this, I guess. The mindset, mind set shifts a little bit from the operations you're trying to get done to the state you want the system to be in. And you are trying to find sort of the whole set of the state. So you have to have to think about that. It's just a little bit different. All right. Uh, yeah. Here's when I'm, so here's here's actually how we want to configure VM. This is it. And that's the backside of your sheet that you have as just in there as well. And we'll actually sort of play with the code, make it make it look this way. We didn't start we didn't actually start out this way, right? When we first did, as I said, we sort of had parameters and functions and everything else. We tried to be smart, but but it turned out once we were done, we said, no, we're gonna create a, and I'll show you how we how we do it in a second. We're going, to, we're going to go create a hash table called Windows Feature, and everything I care about the Windows Feature is going to sit in that hash table. And then we're okay creating a second hash table. So it's going to be a little, there's going to be a few more files, a few more elements, but at least we'll be able to separate them, called virtual switch. And everything I care about my virtual switch settings is going to be in that one. And the VHDs are going to be here. And we actually separated VM from VHD, right? Because they're kind of related but different. So let's go ahead and separate. So you almost end up always having to start at that level and say, what do I want? And then we say, okay, and what about this, this ready environment? Well, maybe the name of the server should be web server, maybe it should be foobar. I don't care, but I should be able to change it one spot and deal with it. And I should, in this case, be able to have a list. You know, I have name and you know, list of parts of a one, two, three, four, five, six, we'll get to that later, right? So I don't care, I just do it the n times. The other part about how you automate, you want to automate two ways, item potency, and also for you know arrays from a, a PowerShell standpoint, like take more than one. This is pretty familiar to you guys from the command list, but it doesn't change when we go here. And is there anything else? I think that's kind of it. So that's just a very different way of looking at the solution. Sort of. Okay. Okay. So um, since so hold on to your sheet, the backside where we talk about the structural versus the environmental configuration. So that's the state we want to reach. We already thought through the problem, what we are trying to do. We are going to install VM, uh, virtual machines with uh, web server roles and stuff. So we thought through, this is the end state we want. And the question becomes is, how do we reach to that end state? And that's the design problem we'll talk about briefly. So we'll ignore the environmental one. Let's first look at the structural configuration. That's the one we are going to start with. So the first and foremost thing is we have to refactor. So if you go and look at the slide. So this used to be the code that we started off initially. We had a big file and a helper file. There we were creating a VM switch. We were hardcoding the names. There were no parameters. And then you give it to somebody else. They said, OK, I already have a switch called internal. This is going to buy or not. And same thing goes with install VM is we, we assume certain things and there was no separation. I'm going to install a VM. I'm going to create a VHD there. What if I already have a VHD? Why do I need to create those VHDs? So that was the old way. And when we started thinking, we said, OK, look at this highlighted line of new VM switch. We'll refactor into a function. Function will take parameters for the name and the switch type. And we'll call it, for this purpose, new demo VM switch. And then we said, OK, let's look at this green 
Oh shit. What this is doing is it's take, taking a parent VHD, it's taking a destination path and it's creating a different index. So why not separate it up? And then we said, oh, we'll call it workflow because it provides parallelism. You can do it with jobs as well. And I can create multiple VHDs here. And then we said, oh, let's look at the blue portion, which is install VM. And essentially, that's the one which is creating the VM. So we separate it out into a new function or command called demo VM. And what it happens is, I did it. It was great. I gave it to Kenneth. And he says, good. When I run it, it gives me red. I'm like, whoa, you are running on the client. And Hyper-V role is not turned on. So that's the part of saying, oh, make sure you have hyper -feed role turn on. So that is the kind of refactoring we did from what's there in the build directory. You will see the one dash build. And if you look at the structural configuration and the functions, you can see the mapping. Oh, the function install demo, Windows option feature, and Windows feature hash table. And that turns out to be the important part. Because we're going to cheat and use that, right? There should be a one to one mapping between your hash tables and your functions. Because essentially, given that hash table, you can find a function that's responsible to make it that way. And only that way. And once you've got that separation down, you're home free. Yes. So your structure configuration is the one. Okay. And your function is the how. And they are tied together. So you can change something in structure configuration, the values of the hash tables, not the keys, and the functions will behave correctly. So that was the refactoring problem. So if now you want to look at the files that we copied under PowerShell Summit, uh, there is a uh, Two dash install VM improve folder, and there there is a zero dash refactor where you will see the new set of code. So take a look if you want, or I can move on. Either way is fine. Okay. So the next piece was okay. We have designed those four functions. How do we invoke them and use them? So the function these are the new names: install demo. Uh, Windows auto feature, VM switch, VHD, VM. So I can put those four lines in a script and run that script I'm going to do check for feature, create the switch, create the VHD, create the VM. And if you see the highlighted portions, those parameter name, Microsoft Hyper VR, all those things are the structural things. I have to think and remember we have this nice hash table that is on the back of your uh, printout. Windows feature, virtual hard disk. And what we can do is, looking at these hash tables and using the concept of splatting, how many people are not aware of splatting here? OK, everybody knows splatting. So using that concept, I can replace the first line with this. Take that hash table, splat it. And I want to see verbose information, I can add verbose. And similarly, the next one, VM switch, takes that hash table, splats it, and on and on. And the last piece which is left is, oh, if all these hash tables are defined in a file, how do I import those hash tables in my environment, in the script which is using this variables? And this is the trick. You can get the content of the file as a raw and do an invoke expression. It will give you a collection of hash tables with the names that you have defined to those. So, that's the piece where you take, refactor it, and start using your structural configuration. And that's the second directory in that folder which says structural configuration. So this is the basic essence of all. All, all we really started doing is we just use PowerShell V3. Nothing terribly complex. We just thought about the problem a little differently. We thought it would be really fun sort of walking through that and actually have the walk through piece of code that does it. By the time we're done, it's obviously see up and up, right? So it's obvious what we've done in the other code notes. The, uh, um, the, uh, the, the, the observation, I just want to make sure we tie it, just for those who might not be quite as aware. Obviously, what we did is we said, we're going to make sure that the parameters to each function by name match the name of the elements of the hash tables. The keys of the hash table are the same as the right. parameters of the function. That's the only way it works, which is what the whole point of the splatting thing. And once you got that lined out, let's see, you start with that that set of hash tables, figure out what you want to do there, 
and then everything else flows downhill after that. It's like, okay, I gotta create a function that deals with this hash table. I gotta create a set of parameters for it. Oh no, I need another parameter. Okay, then I gotta take my hash table, blah, 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 blah. blah. And actually right. that, that's the way you would think and design is when, when we started doing it, we said, okay, what does the structural configuration look like? So oh, I have this hash table, which is going to work with some functions and what property? We, we didn't go backwards. We didn't look at the functions and create a that We said, oh, virtual switch. Switch will have a name and it will have a task. It might have more properties, but since we are creating another switch, and not external one, we don't have to. And same thing with VHDs and uh, virtual machines. One more comment on this one, Radic. And that's, and I don't, I don't know if we have any for that group. Anyway, um, as you're playing with it, the other key difference is between mandatory and optional parameters. Just to be clear, there are, there's value in having mandatory in these cases. There's value in having optional. Frequently, you want the, most of them to be mandatory here, more mandatory parameters than optional because you want to force the person to apply your configuration or not. Right? Because if you don't and they want to change it ever, then they have to go inside your code if you're not careful and change it if they haven't put it inside their config environment. Does that make sense? So mandatory parameters are going to force them to put it in the config environment in, the, in their structural configuration. And if you make it optional, they can put it there. They don't have to. If they don't, then they're going to have to go figure out where is that and so forth. So I just end up discovering as I started playing with it, I made more things mandatory than they normally on a PowerShell function. I didn't try to default everything. I said, now you got to tell me. So at this point, we are in this folder. If you look at it, you have these three separation. The helper actually has the function definition, install game actually got it, and the configuration is the one which is uh, doing the stuff. And yeah, we actually had a choice here for full thing. Full thing. Yes. Install the We had a disagreement as oh, to yes. how we should structure this. I won't tell you who said what. I'm just saying it was a disagreement. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't care which way you do it. For a production system, you probably do want to actually have the module from a, this uh, today it might be easier to actually have an inline. We do it. We do it. We go and we do the import module. So we actually separate it out. The helper functions that match to the uh, uh, structural configuration are in the modules. And that's true throughout all the code you'll see today, right? And so the structure and, and the stuff that uses those that doesn't install, and then as an aside, using the overall environment configuration is more important than the structural configuration. Is in its own little file that's called the install register. So that's just kind of the way things work. Okay. okay, so this is essentially you're calling those, you have a function, and then you're calling that function by passing the values which flows through. Uh, that's, I just wanted to show it. So yes. <coughs> okay, so that was a structural configuration. Is everybody with us? Making some sense, right? I'm seeing all the right now. I just want to make sure I have it. And I got accused last time I did this of going too quickly. <laughs> and definitely, if you have questions, something is not working, just raise your hand and we'll stop. There's nothing. And we got like what, five more slides and we're done. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So, so that was basically separating things out. The next important piece is making things item pool. So if I run it again, it's not going to do the stuff if it doesn't need to. And the way we started doing is, is that, okay, if you look at a specific file, for example, the middle option feature, that's how things would have been if it's not item important. You have one call which is unable this feature. What if it's already enabled? You are on the mercy of the command let to do the right thing. Sometimes they don't. So we'll take that specific one and we'll say, okay, we'll put some space, we are going to put some code here. First and foremost is we are going to call get Windows option feature. We could figure it out if it's already there. And if it's there, check the state. If it's enabled, then don't call it, otherwise don't be caught. So item potent is a complex word, <laughs> which just means do good stuff. Right? <laughs> do your error checking. But you do have to make sure you think about it. It's not actually hard. Most of the time, once you get it, even a difference thing, you know, between a directory, okay, you just do compare objects. It's not that hard. But if you don't do that not hard work, life becomes hard. And most of the scripts I see don't do that not hard work. Right, they're rarely item potent by, by default. Just you know. And the simplest and easiest test of item potency is if you run a script, it does the right thing, run it again. It should not do anything new, or it should not bug. 
and that's how I, I started. Okay, everything learned and coded, right? Oh, I forgot about this one. Check for this. So that was one thing. And since we were doing that in potency, it was very useful to say write out warning message, verbose messages. So when you see it, say, oh, I'm not doing it yet, that's the right state and skipping it. So just from a readability and diagnosability, having verbose messages helps. So that's one. We have three more of these. Uh, we can go faster in the other ones. So this was for DM switch, nothing fancy here. Again, the same logic, call the switch, check if it's there or not. If it's there, don't create it. If it's not created, and if it's there, check if it's the right type, because you want, you care about the type, whether it's public, private, or internal. And again, tons of verbose messages. I gotta say, the verbose thing, it's kind of obvious, but do it. <coughs> Particularly in a system like this, the other thing about a system like this is it feels just a little more opaque sometimes. Because all you're doing is you're modifying the configuration files, right? The structural configuration files, you're modifying them. Then you run this thing and magic kind of happens. And so I just found the verbose useful anytime you bug in just to sort of be able to go and say, what, where's it really at? What's it really doing? Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm happy because it's already installed or it matched my expectations, right? The system was reacting to that. And the other good thing, the way it's set up is you are not touching your structural configuration file at this point. You're not touching the file which is calling these functions. You're just touching the helper function file. And that gives you a separation. If something is wrong, there's less verbose message. You can fix one file and check it rather than, oh, look at 1,000 lines or I don't know what change. So from a user perspective also, it's useful. And this is about the VHDs. You, you used to create them blindly. Now we are going to check if they exist or not, and then only create them. And the last one is the VM. You create a new VM, set processors, and change its state based on what you want. And we said, yes, that works. But again, check for the VM. And if VM doesn't exist, it's going to throw an error. So we have. Have you been using the new VM commandments, by the way? Pretty useful. One of the things to keep doing. And if the state is the right state or not. And that's it. So those were the. Four functions that we created, we had a basic version of them, and then we added the added potency. And you can see all those if you go to your things here. This one is the same thing, but the helper.tsm one has more code. It's a bigger file. Okay. And last is the environmental configuration, which actually changes when you go from dev to test to prod, or you want one VM versus two VMs, or your website should be called fourth coffee, or fifth coffee, or my coffee. And this is what the call looks like. Oh, go and figure out the VHDs from this location, and copy them there, and call this big thing. And we said, OK, we already designed this thing. And you can see, again, the parameter names matches the hash table keys. We just did the same thing, just the next level. And what it enables is you have this simple call. And you just import that hash table. <laughs> the hash table is defined. And that's the thing you go and change. Say, OK, I go from one environment to another. I just change the config file, the environment to config, and nothing else. So that's the run through of what's already there. Does anybody have questions on the stuff you covered? Yes. So I've written stuff on this before, and when it comes to the auto potency, one of the things that I struggled with was the fact that all the available verbs to choose from for my auto potent functions don't really have an auto potent feel to them. They all sort of sound like they're going to, you know, do something. Do mm -hmm. add. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> have you put any? I need to that? make it so verb. <laughs> <laughs> and the problem is we don't allow yeah, it. Exactly. Don't allow that, it. That, that, that would be awesome. I've thought about it, actually. You know, do this. The actual one we end up using in most of this is, is assert. Cool. I just, that's what I ended up choosing because I had the same go by my And I, I do actually own that list. So, <laughs> so I can change it. I haven't quite figured out what the right answer is yet. But we're, uh, I, yeah, that doesn't go on. Thank you. You're right. I think I wanted to use assure. Yeah, that's assert. I, I, I thought of using assure or insure or you know what I mean? But it gets a little a little wonky there too, so we'll we'll debate it. 
And, and the good thing is when you do a assert, you can do a get, set, and test as three separate functions. Test if the environment is the way I want. If not, then call set, and get will tell me what kind of state it is. So you have get, you have new, you have add, and sets, all those things. Now, what we did end up doing is what's funny is we have a cert, a cert, a cert, a cert, and then we actually call. Yeah, you actually want to put the cookies on. The today, where we ended out. So if you want to jump in, we always go to the, the today folder actually says, here's where we actually ended up today. Go to deploy our stuff. Yeah, we actually ended up with deploy our stuff. I just gave up, so I'm just going to call it deploy, because that's what we're actually doing today. We're just going to call it redeploy. I didn't say assert our stuff, I could have. But it actually just calls all the asserts, right? The first thing it does is we assert a, and this is this is what you'll run. Uh, by the end of the day, it'll create the whole thing if you want to, or you can start here. But um, we actually go into the VM and say, okay, we want to assert the VM, and we, because there's a little different configuration between the DC and a web server for the VM, we actually had a different DC configuration file with the same exact set of functions, right? So we just said, assert VM that's a DC. And then we'll assert that the DC exists. And then we'll assert that there's a VM with a website, and we assert that the website exists. And that's like it. Once you're done with everything, that's all you have. That's your deployment script. I don't have to do like the air check, it's all down below. Everything's item potent. So I don't care. It becomes a real simple. The nice thing about this, I gotta say, is it makes it really easy to try. <laughs> you know, I don't even have to remember the parameters. You ever have those pieces of paper, you gotta remember the parameter? Oh, what do I do? I don't. So I'm lazy. I don't have some company. It's just like okay, a certain amount. That's all. Question. Have you considered using the what if on the auto post function to tell you where there's a discrepancy without bringing it into line? This question is: uh, Have we considered using what if to figure out where it's not that important or wasn't going to do? And yes, we thought, but that would mean writing more code. And what if at each commandlet is there some commandlet support it, some some don't, and there they just tell what I'm going to do. They don't even tell you if it's going to succeed or not. So that that was another reason. What if what if it's still good? It just doesn't replace the ad potency of the uh, well, no, in addition to the in quotes again. All right, so let's get started. Let's go back to your slide for two seconds. So here's what I thought we'd do. Um, there's a working directory. We'll take a look at sort of the working directory. Um, first, has everybody, everybody's installed, has everybody expanded the VHD? Everybody's expanded, you've moved it, you've renamed it. Has anybody actually run the test? The 4C, which says uninstalled. Well, I see where you get the test run. Let's just make sure you actually get that test actually running. And it's succeeded. Working. Okay. And then did you clean it up? Okay, do clear it up actually because you want to make sure you actually want to clear. In order to do the clear, um, the, the clear demo, you want to go in and make it edit and then you change the VHD path to whatever it is obviously was on your box. It's going to be different for box. Um, and that way we did not create a config environment file to work. And there might be some errors because it's trying to go to the DC VM and stuff. But so it's a. Yes, yeah, it's a clear. Yeah, so basically that clear was a. Same copy based of what we are going to use when you have a domain controller. So what clear does is saying, I have domain controller, I have web servers, I want to get rid of web servers. Since we have a host files where we are doing the cheating of saying web server one always gets 10.3 address, web server two gets 10.4, I have to go to the DC and clear up the DHCP. So that's what the clear demo is trying to do, uh, and that might fail. So I ran the thing that seemed to run okay, but you mentioned something about if they're running a server, something might need to be changed. What not not so far, but if you're running a server, um, to check if Hyper-V is installed, we use Windows auto feature command list. Well, if you run the test, you will get No. No, it did, it did fail on, you guys call a, uh, call a Windows feature that doesn't exist. On yeah, so Windows auto feature. Yeah, Windows auto feature, yeah. Windows auto feature is out. the, okay. Client side command list and Windows feature is the server side command list. They're owned by different teams, they have different parameters, they have different objects. So that's why uh, if you look into the folder, there is an uh, equivalent of that for server, which is inside the um, today called Windows feature.psm1. And that is actually what you would use for a server's queue. 
the VHDs we have are service to VHDs, so that's where we use it. And you can use the same one on locally to replace the install VM. Uh, install Windows Office feature dot This is the one that you have. So you'll call this function. Okay. Install Windows feature and the parameters might change. Hopefully. Is anybody else running server here? Sorry. I'll make sure you take it. Yeah. Uh, other than that, let's go to the work meeting for a second. And then we're going to go to the show for the OK, so basically, to start playing is you will play under, it's not scripts anymore, it's PowerShell Summit. PowerShell Summit. Slash zero dash working directory. And those are the two things that you have already changed as part of your setup. Just make sure those are changed in the config. env.php1. And all the structure configuration files, dot start or config.php1, have fill in here kind of a comment. And that's basically the keys of the hash table, but the values are not provided and you're supposed to provide. I did leave some of them there, so it's easy. And you have a cheat sheet in the code which says today which has the answers if you get your entry orders. And similarly, if you look at the assert.ts1 file, the calls to the function from the helper function have been removed and there is to do. So you look at those comments and those says what to do. Call this function with splat. I don't tell you what hash table you have to use, but given the configuration and environment, you should be able to figure it out. And Cases where you have to say word post or case complete name, case credentials, those are already specified. So that's so on the thing. That's it. So if we will start, and then if you got troubles, we'll just start. By the time we're done, we should hopefully get everything working. If you want us to walk through the code, bring it up here. I'm happy to bring the code up. Which I'm saying. Beck, do you want to bring that code yes. up for a second? So they so are you can see it? Yes. Well, that's today. So, and I ordered them with one, two, and three, so it's easier. You do the VM one, and you can test it and run it. It's going to create VMs, and clear it up with the existing thing, and then you can configure a DC uh, if you want to get a static IP. Because DC does the domain controller as well as DHCP and DNS. It is called postcoffee.com, the domain, but we are not using it for the time. And the third one is the website. So, second one is the most complicated one. If you want to avoid that, you can. First one is the easiest, number three is the sec is the second difficult, and third one is, and those are the configuration files. Uh, the config env.psv1 is not, um, it's working, I have not removed anything, so that's the entire structure, con uh, environmental configuration. That's still one we have to change in order to actually run it. We have to change the picture. Yes, there's one, yeah, two lines you have to change the beginning, but individual uh, directories have their own structure configuration. VM config dot tsv one those you have to fill out. Yeah, bring us up and see if we see them all. So this is the one which is filled in here. I left the role name because it's not intuitive. Which file is just useful for people to It's hard to, it's hard to find the name when you use get rid of optional feature. Yes. Because you need to go to, to where because to it where. doesn't support the wildcard. Fine card. Exactly. That's, that's a problem. And you will note that there's additional stuff called ensure here. The intent was to, right now I don't do much. This is, I can sure do this. But the intent was ensure if somebody says absent, we can clean it up. But given these are VMs and VHDs, you can just delete the VM and VNG themselves. But the intent of ensure was, I can take value of present or an absent. If you look at the code, it supports present and absent both as a validated set, but the actual code doesn't use those values of absent. Just something to think about. If you are doing something and you want to use the same functions to revert back to the original state, you can use ensure equals an absent mode. So that's the VM one, and I'll show you. Let's get the VM stuff in here for a second. We just thought it would make sense to get the whole VM working so we can have to secure the VM just like you did before when we did the first test to make sure it works. We'll do that again here with the code you guys write. 
Once that's done, we'll just move on to the DC and the website, and then we just create the whole thing. When you're done, it will automatically deploy it back. We can, we'll run it while we're actually starting here. So this is the one which says to do import the structure configuration from this location. And if you use PS clip two, it becomes very easy. You don't have to change your paths too much. You can copy from one place to another. It's a related path. And it's root, not root. Yeah. That's um, so those are the four calls you are doing, or five calls there, and this is the last one. And while you guys are doing that, we'll just go run the one we were doing the other time. Sure. And this is the functions that we created with parameter this time. So once everything is done end to end on a faster laptop with more than eight gigabytes of memory. Mm -hmm. Uh, it takes about 11 minutes to set up a PC, DHCP, DNS, two web servers, turn on IS tools, and deploy a website. Uh, DC, DC, DHCP takes about seven minutes. The other takes four for two, so it's two, two, two minutes per web server. Can we collect all the USBs, please? So yeah, we are about at two o'clock mark. We have two hours or more to play, ask questions, troubleshoot. And once you get it going, if you guys got it going already, then the next step is to just go delete one of the one of the websites or one of the VMs and go run it again. Just sort of check the item potency, start yeah. messing with it. Yeah, when that's running, you can just go it. and delete the VM, delete the VHV. The script is item potent is going to check. VHV is already there, VM is not there. Change the VM, you can do it again, go and start the yeah. VM instead of running. It'll go and check if it's stopped or called. It'll make it running because you have states set. So, or you can go and change the structure configuration to say, I don't want it running, I want it to be stopped. So, no VMs here. I still have three cheat sheets. So, who needs those? Are you the only one? Probably. So, hopefully, our demo will actually work on starting. Because you'll see a lot of proposals coming out of the screen. As you guys noticed, by the way, I just had to go do the same thing, change the configuration environment because we hadn't updated this particular computer. But here I can just easily start saying, well, I also want web server three. And then theoretically, I'll have three web servers. We'll see when I finish the demo. <laughs> this is what was fun.
So uh, one thing Kevin mentioned is the credential. So the way uh, credential thing is, in the past we were hard coding the credentials, um, actually the password in clear text and say secure thing and blah blah blah. And one neat way is you can generate those credentials up front and serialize them to the disk. The only problem is it's going to work on that specific machine. So what I'm doing is I'm going to import them and if import fails, I say, oh, these are not very credentials. Give me the credential. So that's the safest I could find without doing a key value pair exchange or more uh, demanding work to say. So right here, I've got local credentials. Yeah, local so credentials and local credentials on anybody's box is not very safe. Yes. However, apparently, we're updating the hospital. Thank you. 
time to take it. So the error can be just basically measured as a value. So also in See his answers in one of the. Uh, No, this is this is just a test. I'm sure you set up like some virtual machine side. This is like this is just a test. Yeah, that's the first thing. Yeah, that's the first thing. So we're going to be uh, maybe I misunderstood, kind of improvements in process. So it's kind of copies, similar copies, but like uh, initial runs are better and then best kind of improves. And then we're starting with a base file and doing it ourselves. What we're trying to do today.
Kind of like mine. So okay. I understand. I look in the mirror, I see it. It's good. this successfully. Good. And now I'm confused. We we're both confused about okay. another two things. We we're supposed to do all the fillings, right? And you can cheat and just use this if you want. Right? You kind of said, so where's your, where's your virtual switch? Um, oh, you know, he has a, uh, oh, that's, that's fair. So, uh, so working right. Hey, yeah. go to config environment. Yes, you want to open that up. Now, this has a tendency to give you. Can we, can we hit control R? Can we hit control R again? Where are the five? There. Okay, I can, I can do better with this. Sorry. Um, so. If you're down here in the VM side, when you start to sort of start to configure your VM config, um, it can help, but cheat a little. <laughs> you got this spreadsheet, we got the sheet frame, which is kind of fine. Uh, the other thing worth noting is, and these are all the alpha functions that we talked about before, right? The set VM and everything else, this is the module we actually import. And there's a one to one mapping between the name of these functions and the hash tables here. So they're the ones that are going to make it to redefine it, as Bruce would call it, to make it so. Um, also, in this uh, function are some of these uh, parameters that are already sort of <clears throat> provided to you the switch name, the switch type, and everything else. Right? And so they're now going to be available to the various elements of your config about PS and Google, right? So if I was here, I would probably just cheat a bit. If I'm here on VM and take PSD1 and I want to switch name, you know, I'd probably end up with just sort of uh, that, right? Because I'm able to grab it from the function that's actually calling it. It's environmental. It should be in the environment. Is that sort of a, a parameter? So when you start to like to fill them in, you just steal them from a model. It should be okay. So I want to make sure people have that uh, have that focus. Reify, yeah, I'm using a new verb called reify. No, we're not doing that. Configuration of PS3 dot dot so I know I can't believe it. I'm here. 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 I
Oh. Anybody want to see if the demo actually worked? In theory, oh no, it doesn't exist. No, it does. I don't know. Make sure. All right, we do have a DC and two web servers. In theory, if I click on one of these DCs, it will go to web server one, and you will see cupcakes. I've come to love cupcakes. There you are. So the demo kind of worked. You got a web server one. You got a web server two. In theory, it's waiting. There you are. No change. Isn't that great? And so, anyway, and then I'll go through it. I'll, I'll start messing up here. You'll call the new files and, and, and show that as if you guys want to continue work. I just thought I'd pull over that. That's because I actually did it on this one instead. Oh, okay. I'll go, I'll go, I'll go create a web server just for you. Okay. So here's like, here's this thing. I'll, I'll be back to it. Yeah, that's the one that's basically telling you that you work and then all that. In fact, I'll show you web server three is a complete failure right now. <laughs> It should fail. To show that I'm actually have nothing up my sleeve. There you are. See? I'm out of the Just be switch name. You might wonder where the hell that came from, right? If you take a look down here, this one, the config environment is going to be run, and then this is going to be splatted, right? It's a DC VM, so it's splatted to the VM, and so you'll have this available to you now. So this is how that got the parameters. In this case, you'll just be making a basic web VM <coughs> when you first do it. So again, the parameter would just be switch name. So you've got the environment. This is where the structural configuration is able to take advantage of the fact that it's already defined in the overall configuration environment. If on the if on my web VMs I didn't want to call it internal, I wanted to call it, I don't know what I call it. External. External. I want to call it, I'm not typing that. If I want to call it external, then I just want to make sure that I actually switch both of these. Right? I could I, I could call the type external and call it, you know, my external switch, and that would actually flow all the way through. Once you got the system set up. And in that case, you would have two switches. One is internal of type internal, other is my external switch of type external. And, so, and at one point, you could bring this configuration and this configuration together. We find because most of the time, this is structural, I say, never changes. This one does change. It's kind of nice. But as you can tell, there is a tie. You have to, when you define this, you say, okay, what do I want the environment to be able to define? And just use variables here instead of hard coding. I could hard code it in the in the VM structural config, but then the environment can't change it. Does that make sense? We'll walk through it. These ties between the elements that are the tricky part to get the whole thing to all work. Nice. What do you think? I don't know. If we'll, yeah. <laughs> I haven't run it on this demo, so we'll see if it works. Okay. <laughs> it worked. It'll work. You think? I don't know. That's today. I've got the right config, right? See if the red shows up. It's gone. Yeah, I thought 
Yeah, so here, I would, I would use that because you, you're yeah. it's defined in the you're missing the one. So go to a certain PM. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Go to a certain PM. Does that mean? So it's the actual time. So you guys got a call from the Actually, it's Yeah. So I'm going to do when you hear the end, you can trade the end for the end. So you use different layers of space. But here, you import that DS grid. So we can take it by Those things are defined as a building file. So that's right. You want to get that? I didn't set the on So all of these things, it's not going to be big old thing in the machine. Oh, that's true. Yeah. But everything you define in the machine. So I'm going to show you something that's out there. So here's the sign down a little bit. Question where to switch I come from, blah, blah, blah. If you, so what do you have open? All right, get rid of, I don't care about the DC config. So go to a certain PM for a second. All right, a certain PM. Now, if you scroll down a little bit. So, uh, one of the things that a couple of people here. are running into is the sim session files are failing. And that is typically happens when you have a physical connection on. If you have internet connection on, you have two two switches or two adapters to talk to, and it don't, doesn't know which ones to pick. I believe by default it picks a physical one, and that doesn't have a 192.168. So, turn off your physical switches. Just keep the virtual one on. Turn off your wireless. Wireless, yes. Um, so what you're doing is you're going to call website. This this install the uh, you can put it. In. You're going to call it with spray. Yeah. And what are you going to spray? So you're going to uncomment this thing. Yes. It's something. So you're going to call install so the which is this. Yeah, the loud band. Okay. So, yeah. So another but question that you mentioned, a lot of people are asking is, how do I know what value to put in in my environmental config file or in the structural config file when it's running, started, and there, there's one answer: need comments because in the code, the code will bar because code has a validate set. It says this value should be running. Or pause or stop. 
or sorry, op. So those are the three values, and there essentially you need to know what states a VM can be in. So putting comments in the config file would have been most beneficial. Which I haven't got. You see this VM? You see this web VM config environment? That's what. See three and four words. We did it. Expression. So, now, in case people were wondering, on this assert VM piece right here, you'll notice that we have this one function called install VM. I think I've worked through it. I just want to make sure everybody's got this because I, I talked to a few more people also. We do say if you're going to install a DC, then you're going to want to slap one set of parameters from the config environment. If you're going to call a website, you're going to want to slap a different set of parameters from the config environment. If you take a look at your config environment, you end up with a DC, VM config, so that's what you would splat into DC, right? And web config for the web environment. These, should, these obviously have exactly the same structure, because you need the same information, they just have different values in the end, right? One's in the main controller name, the other one's in the web server name, so we decide we want to get one five call versus 10, 24. So that's how you can differentiate. You just leverage the same function for the same thing. And then all of these parameters we set became available because we wanted to enable the dev, test, and production to change them. Right? If as soon as I enable it in the config environment, the dev, test, and production can change it. If I hard code it here, they can't change it. And that's good or bad. Right? I always want the hyper be there. I don't really care what the switch name is. So that's where you make that distinction. That's how you do it. And then if anybody ever gets lost and you're going, oh, I just don't get this, I give up. Feel free to you know, drop over here to the, uh, the today directory and just go, you know, run it. I'll take it to the environment, point to the right PhDs, but you should actually be able to run it. And it should deploy one web server. That's what's why they're running up here, right? And then they update it to run. So you can always, you can always drill into this, in, into this directory and, and uh, take it from the bottom. Oops. Don't you love IntelliSense and the LSE? That's it's great. Somebody actually asked, well, should, when, wouldn't you want to make sure that you could, you know, in a physical environment, you want to do this, would you want to check so you can do any number of switches? And the answer is yes and no. In the real world, I freaking all the machine, and I wouldn't let you do anything that I didn't want you to do on it if there was a web server in my data center. Does that make sense? So in that case, I do care. If you're a management server, I, I wouldn't let you have physical connections because it's going to be running. But otherwise, you want to make sure you test it. And, Yeah, that's fine. Uh, I always see people, like, when you have those hash tables, you know, it's an easy way to do a certain game. I love this idea that, uh, so as opposed to having a huge long command, yeah. 